Have you ever wondered why some people panic over small risks while others ignore serious dangers? Why a small outbreak can cause widespread fear, yet thousands of deaths from preventable diseases go unnoticed? The reality is that people perceive and respond to risk in very different ways, and that can be shaped by how risk is communicated. The way we talk about risk can shape whether people trust information or dismiss it, whether communities react with panic or preparation, and ultimately whether lives are lost or saved. In this video, we'll take a look at the basics of risk communication and how it can be done well. But first, what is risk? Risk is a measure of the likelihood of being exposed to a hazard and the consequence if exposure occurs. It can be measured qualitatively, for example, using a risk matrix into categories like low, medium, or high, or quantitatively, using statistical or mathematical modeling, or a mix of both. Communicating this risk and what to do about it is a core function of public health. It allows people to make informed and timely decisions so they can take appropriate action to protect themselves and others, like moving away from rapidly moving bushfire wearing a mask during a respiratory disease outbreak, or avoiding floodwaters during a severe storm. But we know that people respond to risk in very different ways. The response is shaped not only by scientific facts or statistics, but by how they perceive the risk itself. This perception can vary significantly from person to person and is influenced by various factors, such as personal characteristics, psychological traits, culture, peer norms, social identity, values, and the level of knowledge and understanding about the risk. Understanding risk perception is important because it helps tailor communication that encourages people to take appropriate action. Now, there are many frameworks to understand risk perception. Let's explore a well-known approach developed by risk communication expert Peter Sandman. In Sandman's model, what risk means to people is determined not only by technical risk, which is the likelihood and consequence of a hazard, but also by a factor called outrage. Outrage refers to how upset people are about the risk. Outrage can be high for several reasons, such as when the risk is catastrophic, coerced, industrial, when it's exotic or unknown, or when there's a lack of control over the risk. Sandman uses the term hazard for the technical risk, but in this video, let's use risk to keep things consistent. And here's the thing, risk and outrage are not always proportional. There can be high risk and low outrage, or low risk and high outrage. Therefore, effective risk communication should be mindful of and address both the actual risk and the outrage. Because of this, the same approach cannot be used for all scenarios. Let's look at this visually. Imagine a graph of risk on one axis from low to high and outrage on the other from low to high. When the risk is high but the outrage is low, the goal is to raise awareness and motivate people to take protective action. This is known as precaution advocacy. When the risk is low but outrage is high, the focus shifts to outrage management helping people understand the situation, correct misinformation, and reassure them about small or minimal risks. When both the risk and outrage are high, the focus is on crisis communication, supporting people who are upset and guiding them through serious risks. When risk and outrage are both moderate, it represents an ideal state or sweet spot where ongoing dialogue and building trust can be maintained and communication can be proactive. Okay, now that we know what needs to be done, the next question is how to do it. Let's focus on crisis communication. In a crisis, people experience a wide range of emotions, such as stress, fear, loss, helplessness, and uncertainty. This can influence how information is received, processed, and acted on. The United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention outlines several key ways in which information is processed during a crisis. In a crisis, we tend to simplify messages, hold on to current beliefs, seek additional information or opinions from multiple sources such as friends, family, and social media, and often the first message we hear is the one that's believed. Recognizing this, they've identified six key principles to guide effective risk and crisis communication. 
These are be first. During a health emergency, it's important to get health messages out quickly so people can take timely action to protect themselves and others. The first message is often the one that's believed, so timeliness is important. Be right. When communicating risk, it's important to be right and clear about what is known. Acknowledge what is still unknown and explain what is being done to find the answers. Be credible. Credibility relies on honesty and truthfulness and should not be compromised. Express empathy. Crisis can lead to distress, uncertainty, fear, and loss. Acknowledging people's emotions and showing genuine care for their experiences helps build connection and trust. Promote action. In addition to protecting themselves and others, giving people something meaningful to do can reduce anxiety and restore a sense of control. Show respect. Treating everyone with dignity, empathy, and understanding encourages cooperation, builds trust, and strengthens community bonds during times of crisis. And those are the six steps. Today's public health emergencies bring additional challenges. Risk communication takes place within a broader information ecosystem. This is a dynamic network of sources, channels, and people that influence how information is created, shared, and interpreted. And during a health event, an infodemic can occur. The World Health Organization describes an infodemic as an overabundance of information, accurate or not, in the digital and physical space accompanying an acute health event. Information voids, which are gaps in the availability, accessibility, or clarity of trustworthy information, can fuel the infodemic. In today's interconnected digital world, information travels in seconds, and with so much content flying around, it can become really hard to tell what's real and what's not. The problem is that some of the information is false. Some of it is misinformation. False or misleading information shared without intent to harm. And some of it is disinformation. False content deliberately created to deceive people. Either way, both can cause harm. That's why effective risk communication is critical. In public health, risk communication is more than just messaging. It's the vital link that shapes how people understand and respond to risk. At its heart, it's about engaging communities, helping people make informed decisions, and constantly learning and improving through ongoing evaluation. It's important that risk communication should not wait for a crisis. It needs to be planned, practiced, and built into every part of public health preparedness. And that's a quick overview of risk communication. To learn more, check out the resources linked below.